lions and tigers and user capabilities. Um, so I, I had this slide up. I work at SoundCloud, um, which probably you've heard of. Hands up if you have not heard of SoundCloud. That's totally cool. Cool. OK, so I don't have to talk about it. Um, and my name is Tiffany, and you might know me as Theophany, which is what I go by pretty much everywhere. And um, my specialty is building uh, web-based tools, and especially tools used by operational staff. So I don't really, at this time, work on user-facing things that you would have seen. I work on uh, internal tools for our customer support team to use to administrate users, and also our so-called content team, which is like the business development team, and they help administrate users as well, and um, they, they get an administrative view. So that's sort of my specialty. Um, I've also worked on a customer relations management system, content management systems, um, and yeah, so tools essentially. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk about user capabilities, which means the things that people can do, but it's also more importantly the things they can't do. Like, let's be honest, that's, it's about what they can't do. Um, and in your career as a designer or a developer or of software, you will very likely encounter some need to restrict access uh, to some features of the software that you're building. And this is obviously true, especially as someone like myself who builds tools, but I think that this actually extends to many other things. So just some examples. Um, in a WordPress blog theme, only the theme, uh, only the author should be able to edit things, um, and only when they're signed in. Uh, you might have a site where only premium users should get access to special features. Or only supervisors can edit the products of a store and the clerks can't. So in my own work, as I mentioned, I build a user administration system and I'm continuously adding new features. And this is grayed out, not because I'm redacting the content, but just so it's not distracting. What does that mean? Um, so, Obviously, when I build a lot of these new features, some of them are really powerful and should only be accessible by authorized people. Authorized meaning they have the training to know that they're using the tool properly. And when I wanted to introduce access restrictions um, in the application that I built, I went on a hunt for existing approaches for handling user capabilities. And I've gathered some of those findings, and I will now share them with you. So I've divided the talk into two parts. Uh, part one, the UX of user capabilities, which will sort of justify the next second part, which is part two, implementing user capabilities. So part one, the UX of user capabilities, which I learned last time I gave this talk is kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> so I apologize if I say it weird. Um, so why would you care from a UX perspective about user capabilities? Um, I have sort of three ideas um, that good user capability UX helps people to avoid mistakes, understand their capabilities, and easily manage permissions. So the first one, uh, good user capability UX helps people to avoid mistakes. So let me ask this question, which is perhaps obvious. That's totally not my fault. Should we try and fix it? We'll keep going. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So let me ask the following question: um, Why add user access restrictions to the system anyway? Fear. Yeah, yeah. I think the the obvious answer is related to that, which is people should not be able to do things they're not allowed to do. Like obviously, right? Um, but the alternative is we could just trust people and. Um, they and, and ask them not to do the things they're not allowed to do, which is one approach you could do in like a like, for example, um, maybe the developers at your company they're not supposed to do things, but they could. Like they have the ability to go in and drop tables from the database, but you just ask them not to, and you trust them not to. But so they shouldn't be able to do it, but they can. Um, and in society, we have lots of examples of this where we just have a sign that says "Don't do it." But, tech, but like nothing is actually preventing me from, from doing whatever it is that the science says I'm not supposed to do. So in computer environments, we don't have to just trust people um, because we have the ability to at least attempt restricting access. So um, beyond that, though, there's another idea that emerged in the 1970s, which is people should not be able to do the things 
They do not need to do. Um, and this is known as the principle of least privilege. And it states that an agent must only be able to do, uh, must only be able to access the information and resources that are necessary for its legitimate work and for its le legitimate purpose and nothing more. And when you apply this to people, it translates to giving people the lowest level of user rights that they can have and still do the work they need to do. And the principle was designed to limit the potential damage of any security breach, whether accidental or malicious. Um, I think it also makes sense for user experience, because you should not allow users to make mistakes. Um, it's not their fault if they don't understand um, what they should and should not do. You, and if you follow this principle, for security reasons, you just get this user experience out of it. And it's not entirely for free, though. You can't just make the feature not work. Um, you shouldn't let people think they can do things they can do and then not have it be possible to actually do it because um, that would be annoying. So the next point then is that good user capability UX helps people to understand their capabilities. Um, like I said, that, that would be really annoying, but also um, perhaps they should understand why they can't do it. And for me, this idea follows directly from the basic considerations of interaction design, which are um, interaction design asks, how does the user affect change? So maybe what buttons or links are required? Um, how do they understand the change? What feedback do they have? What statuses can they see? Um, and how do they understand what they can change? Um, meaning how can they know what effect they can have and what they're allowed to do? And this last part um, is exactly the reason why a user should understand what their capabilities are. They should be able to understand what they can change. So your UI must communicate what the person can do. But it also must not communicate to the person that they can do something they can't. Because like I said, that would be really frustrating. And it's vital that your UI reflect what their capabilities are and not give them the impression of otherwise. And it would be very uh, poor UX to have non-functioning parts. People talk about, you know, if a button is disabled, it should look disabled, or you know, maybe it shouldn't be there. And exactly telling people how, um, why they can't do something is, um, maybe they can't do it because it's disabled, but then they don't understand that it's because they don't have permission or something. And um, there are some except, uh, exceptions to, to this, um, not thinking, letting them think they can do something they can't. And a couple examples I have is, um, in my system, if there's a feature that a person um, is not permitted to use, and they click a button which um, expands a modal to do that, in that modal it explains to them, you don't have the permission to do this. Um, if you think you need to do this for your work, talk to your supervisor or email this person. And then they know exactly, oh, it's because I don't have permission. This is possible, but I need to be granted permission. So it gives them something that they can use to, to learn more. Um, the other thing you might do is you might have a feature where um, uh, it appears you can do a feature, and you click it, and it says, hey, uh, you can't do that unless you're signed in. Maybe you should sign in. Or like, oh, you can't do that. Our premium users can do that. Maybe you'd like to upgrade. So this at least tells the person why they can't do it and how they could get the ability to do it. So this is what I mean that um, those are the exceptions for letting someone think they can do something and then telling them why they can. So uh, next point was that uh, good user capability UX helps people to easily manage permissions. And this is on the other side. So if you're like me, then you didn't have to just build the interface that people used. You also had to build the interface where people actually manage these permissions. Right? Someone has to manage them. Um, you could have it just directly in the database and someone has to go in and change it. But Ideally, someone would be able to actually administrate the user capabilities. Um, if it's end user features, maybe a sales team would do it, or um, you know, some bit of logic sets something, or if it's something like a tool like the kind I build, um, you know, supervisor should be able to set it. So good news, you do not have to invent an approach for managing permissions. I mean, you can, but like they are, there are existing approaches. You may want to know what they are before you implement one. So I just would like to go over some definitions of what the existing options are. 
Um, and what we're looking for then is the one with the better UX for easily managing permissions. So, definitions. Um, this vocabulary uh, comes from computer science. It's useful to know some terms so that you know what to think about and how to express these ideas. I already talked about the principle of least privilege, um, and now I'll discuss some other terminology, as well as the two most popular uh, approaches that are used. So, uh, first definitions. Subject, object, operation, permission, capability. In detail, um, the subject is the active entity, such as a user or as a, a process. This is the subject. An object is a thing. It's the, the thing that the subject acts on. Operation is uh, the action that is attempted by the subject on the object. So a quick example would be a person deletes a file and the operation is deleted. And permission is the right to perform the action, or to perform the operation. Um, and then a capability is the allowed operation that the subject has permission to perform on an object. So it's just an action that you have permission to do. That's your capability. So quick summary, a subject is a person, object is a thing, operation is action. Permission gives capability to a person to perform an action on a thing. Cool. Pretty straightforward. Um, now let's look at the two approaches. There are ACL, access control lists, and RBAC, which I will never say out loud again, role-based access control. And so, first one, uh, access control list. Um, using the formal terms, an access control list is a list of permissions for an object, and typically each entry specifies a subject and an object for the operation. Okay, um, a, an operation for the object. So let's say this in our other terms, which is, an access control list is a list of people who can perform an action on a thing. And each entry is the actor and the, and the action and the thing. Really obvious example here would be Alice can view products, Alice can edit products, Bob can view products. And if you've ever used um, uh, the permissions in a Unix system, you've seen something like this, or conceptually have pictured it in your head. So um, let's look at the UX of maintaining an access control list. Um, as I said, I wanted something that a non-programmer could administrate to easily onboard employees. That's what I was looking for. And the main thing that should maybe be obvious if you've ever encountered anything like this is that maintaining an access control list can be very tedious. And I'll give you an example. So imagine you work in a warehouse. I'm going to picture the warehouse. Are you imagining it? Okay. So imagine you work in a warehouse, and you've just hired a new junior warehouse clerk. And the clerk's job will be to add incoming orders into the system, and they're going to check over the orders before they leave the warehouse, and they're allowed to make changes to the orders that customers are asking for. And it's your job to add this person into the order management system and make sure they have all the permissions that they need to do their job. And you go to do that and you get a list of operations per object. How do you know which actions to allow on which things? You would need to understand the job of this warehouse clerk. You would need to know what their job is in order to actually do this. Every time you onboard somebody, you're like, Right, what are the daily tasks of a warehouse? Okay, right, they need to be able to edit, blah, blah, blah. they need to be able to do these things. Um, what if it turns out that one day a week this, uh, this warehouse clerk is actually going to be a sales rep and they're actually going to make outbound phone calls and, and start generating orders. So suddenly they're going to need more permissions um, to do that one specific thing. They're going to need to be able to look at customers' contact information, maybe update customers' contact information, maybe create new customers. And these are whole new bits of functionality that they did not need as a warehouse clerk, and maybe you wouldn't want them to have. Also, they're a junior warehouse clerk, that maybe they have some slightly lower uh, capabilities than, than a, someone who's been around who's been trained a little better. So this is really not maintainable, and it's hard to understand. Um, and what if you needed to update this list? What if you decided that the role of the warehouse clerk changed 
um, what they were, what their day-to-day -day job was was slightly different, or you added a new feature, and suddenly you would have to go, okay, who all is working as a warehouse clerk? I need to go in, I need to update the permissions. I need to make sure that everybody who does this task has actually got the permissions to do it. Um, and you would have to do it all individually. And uh, this is gross. And this is a random example, this uh, list. If you actually look at it here, um, it's just a random example I pulled from the internet trying to explain how to grant permissions in SharePoint. And uh, this is the rest of the website that I pulled this from, um, explaining how to grant permissions uh, in SharePoint. And uh, there's a saying that says, uh, a user interface is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it isn't very good. <laughs> um, you might be thinking, what about permission groups? So this brings me to role-based access control. To the rescue. Um, instead of granting each person a laundry list of possibly changing capabilities, you instead uh, think in terms of the roles that they play in the, that ex you think in terms of the roles that exist in the organization. So a role then, uh, in my example, is a job function in an organization, but just more generally, it's any collection of capabilities. And the permission to perform a certain capability is assigned to a role. And then um, a single capability can be assigned to different roles. And more importantly, people can have more than one role. So the junior warehouse clerk can get the junior warehouse role, and they can get the call center role, and you don't have to think beyond that. And when a role is changed, everyone who has that, has that role uh, gets all the changed capabilities as well. And with this uh, approach, um, granting people's permissions means you no longer have to understand what, what that role entails. That only has to happen once um, when you're defining the role or when you're adding a new feature. It sort of becomes part of the design process of that function. Uh, you know, how does this fit into everything else people are doing? So I think it's pretty obvious my opinion on this. Uh, which is better for UX, role-based access control, or uh, access control lists? I said that bad UX leads to mistakes. Um, and when you're trying to administrate all these little things, you're going to make mistakes. Um, I've seen it happen. Or what happens is, uh, in order to um, make sure you haven't made a mistake so the person can't do their job, you just give them all of the permissions. And um, this can lead to violations of the, princ the principle of least privilege. You just give everybody everything and say, I trust that you're not going to do the things you're not supposed to do which is the whole point of having them in the first place, right? So obviously role-based access control is better in UX than access control lists. So recap, part one. Uh, good user capability UX helps people to avoid their mistakes, uh, understand their capabilities, and is easily, uh, <coughs> easily manage permissions. Helps people to easily manage permissions. Um, they avoid mistakes by following the principle of least privilege. Um, they understand their capabilities because your UI tells them. And uh, you can easily manage permissions by using role-based access control. So part two, mm -hmm. implementing uh, user capabilities. And if you went to <coughs> Berlin JS, uh, this is where I ended the talk. And so now here's the second part. So uh, first, my assumptions. Um, we're talking about, uh, I'm, in this example, we're talking about uh, client-side rendered apps, because it's JavaScript, right? Um, that, that's my main, that's my focus here is on uh, client-side rendered apps, but obviously this can apply um, to service-side rend rendered apps. Um, they use a REST API to load and save data asynchronously, like a client-side app would be doing. Um, the server can tell you uh, details about the authenticated user, and um, yeah, like I said, some of these ideas apply to server-side rendered views. So, my implementation implementation constraints are: I should only grant the necessary capabilities, as we said before. Um, my UI must communicate the capabilities, uh, and I'm supposed to use role-based access control. And all this followed from the first part. And one second. See if I can. 
not bad. My frequency of coughing is definitely going down. Um, I also had one additional constraint when I was uh, building this, and um, it's so fundamental uh, that I numbered it zero, which is the server side must enforce the restrictions. And this is super obvious, like obviously. I think uh, everyone has done this, where you just edit what's in the UI yourself because you, like, it didn't have the country you wanted or it may, anyway. Obviously, the server side needs to also enforce these restrictions. Um, so, the server side must enforce the restrictions and the client side must reflect the restrictions. So, so now what we have is like both sides need to know the same thing. Um, and this started to sound like code duplication and started to gross me out. And I specifically was like, how can I have all the answers in the right place and not have like the same logic duplicated in multiple places? Um, and I wanted to avoid logic like this. So you should not do this. Uh, if they're a junior warehouse clerk in their roles, or they're a warehouse clerk, or they're a warehouse manager, uh, show the orders button. So I wanted to avoid something like this. Um, these rules that a junior warehouse clerk can view orders, that is what the roles define. They, role, they define the capabilities. Uh, viewing orders is the capability that's, that's actually encoded in the rule set. That's what, that's what being a junior warehouse clerk means. It means you can view orders. So you want to be able to say, you know, if the user's capabilities ha is viewing orders. So you, the user has the role, but what you need to know is you need to know what their capabilities are because that's what you're trying to ask the question. So is viewing orders in the capabilities? Show the order button. Um, the client needs to know these capabilities, and in order to not duplicate this logic everywhere, the you know junior warehouse clerk, whatever, it needs to be able to ask the server like, what are the user's capabilities at this time? Um, or it needs to either be able to ask, or it proactively tells it in some way. Um, I say that because I actually, uh, when I render the page, um, one of the static E type assets that's delivered is the user's capabilities, but essentially the server is telling the client um, what the capabilities are. And um, if you needed to implement getting those, you might have like a, an internal API that's like, give me uh, the, the capabilities for the current signed in user, um, and then I would just assign the capabilities onto this user object, which apparently is global-ish. So, um, and, you, and then uh, because uh, these capabilities might change, you would then need to think about a strategy for making sure that these capabilities are up to date. But if they're out of date, that's kind of okay because the server is going to enforce them. That is the gospel. So the front end might, if you imagine like, we're going to fire that person, we're going to change the capabilities, like they might get an error message before the UI is updated, for example. Um, another more reasonable example might be you only allow someone to be signed in one session at a time, and they sign out somewhere, and both sessions have to reflect the current state. That's a, maybe a less, um, uh, maybe a nicer example. Um, so yeah, you uh, we need to figure out a strategy for keeping this up to date. Um, maybe as soon as the person gets an error, it refreshes or something. Um, and that, so this example I showed uh, only checked for one capability. Um, but what if the UI element is something a little bit more complicated? So instead of being one button, it's this little menu. Uh, it says view orders, uh, manage orders, edit customers. And um, if, they, if, the, if the user cannot view orders, nor can they manage orders, nor can they edit customers, maybe you don't want to show the little menu button at all. Because otherwise you click it and it would be empty or something. Um, so, you would need to check for more than one capability in this way. You would say, is view orders in the user capabilities, edit orders in the user capabilities, and so on, and then you would show the drop-down menu. Um, I thought about this a lot, and it's actually hard for me to justify. I, I thought about doing some math to prove it, but um, capability checking is, is additive. Um, you use ORs. Um, I think the most direct way to explain this is that um, when you define a capability as something which is necessary to do an action, it becomes sufficient. And so then 
It's additive. I, 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 can't, I wasn't able to fully explain this. Um, why, why it's going to just be as simple as ores. I, I, sorry. <laughs> but it is. Um, which means that you can ha have one method which takes an array of capabilities and just checks if any of them are there. The rules just don't get more complicated than that. That I've seen, I think they definitely can get more complicated, but um, I couldn't prove it to myself. Um, and this is what I use. I have uh, a CAM method. Um, it takes the user, which has the capabilities on it, and a collection of actions, and it just checks for any of them. So a uh, nice way to do that using the, the newest ECMAScript syntaxes is like required capabilities has some of the passed in capabilities. Great. So um, this is the CAN method on the JavaScript side. And um, then you can write if the user can do something, go. So it reads pretty nicely in the JavaScript side. And if you wanted it to check if it can do two things, it's like that. So what about logic list templates? So I use Mustache uh, for the stuff I do. Um, some of the other projects at SoundCloud use Handlebars. So this is sort of what I was thinking about, was how am I going to actually make this work inside of Mustache templates without the if in there. Um, so in your view code, um, you would have, uh, you can, in the, when, you're, when you're rendering the template, pass in the can um, collection, and then in the actual template, you can say can view orders. I just changed the syntax here to be, um, previously I had spaces, and now I have, it's just nicer. Um, every single slide, the, the code is designed, the choice of capitalization and so on is actually designed not to be uh, flowing from one slide to the other, but to make each slide self explanatory. So, but then I just spent all this time explaining it. Anyway, so in the, in the mustache template, you would have this collection, um, like it would not be actually an array in this case, it would be a hash, and you would say can view orders exists, then view orders. And um, it can get a little bit more intense if you, uh, so it, and then for each individual thing, you can say can it view this, yeah, show it, if not, yeah, so like that. Um, and then you're just looking for existence and truthiness. So the problem is this doesn't this doesn't work. You can't nest it this way to say, you know, um, can the user view orders? Can they create orders? Because as I said before, this is for showing the little navigation uh, menu. This doesn't work because they're not um, uh, they're not ands. They're ors. This just doesn't make sense. And so um, I would argue that you should augment your capabilities with your view-specific ones. And if, if you're not going to augment your view with your view-specific properties, then what else are you going to do in your view? Anyway, um, so in this example, before you uh, render the view, you would say, um, let me just calculate whether or not view menu is true and add it onto the capabilities. Um, you still pass it in the same way, and then you can say can view menu is view specific. So this is the logicless template approach, which actually means you end up doing all the logic in the pre-state, calculating what's going to be passed in. So um, handlebars has, um, has anybody used handlebars here? Yeah, so some folks have used handlebars. Just as comparison, who has used mustache? Okay, so um, I think these are very similar to other types of uh, templates. But in handlebars, you can have these uh, block helpers where you can uh, pass in um, uh, parameters, or, and then the implementation of the block helper would be you take those required capabilities, um, and you return true or false whether they have the capabilities that are required. Um, and then that way, this whole can block is actually going to um, either render if it's the outside part has any, or it's going to not um, render otherwise. So that's how you do it with uh, Netherverse. <coughs> and um, I use the same <coughs> concept on my server side in order to um, handle everything. I have uh, Sinatra clients, uh, Sinatra clients, Sinatra servers. And each route, I block the route based on the capabilities necessary for that route. 
by having the same kind of thing in Ruby. There's a can method, it takes a user, and it takes um, the uh, list of uh, capabilities, and then if it can, it renders it, otherwise it does something different. So, in conclusion, um, I have these implementation constraints, which are only grant the necessary capabilities, only, uh, you must communicate your capabilities and use role-based access control. And um, we also needed to consider that both the server and the client um, need to enforce it, but the server should be the authority, and you should be checking against capabilities, not the roles, and that's the key thing to be looking at here. So, thank you. So, we have a lot of time for questions. Yes. Why the can helper is not a method of the user? Oh, could you do you could do it that way too, sure. And then it would be like user.can and just read differently. Probably you don't need a lot of helpers in the views in that case. Because you just if if can, yeah. user can. Yeah. Um, the reason why I kept it that way in my examples is because um, on the I wanted to keep it both on the same on both sides. And I I actually had that version of my slides at one point, like user.can. Um, Egal, like, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Very important to Yeah. It's true, I actually learned that one really early on. That and, like, to <laughs> Oh, and, and, like, tagging yeah. mal under the end of every, any number, and then you don't have to actually speak a whole sentence. Yeah. Instead of saying, like, oh, you should dance by blah, you can just be like, zwei mal, and then you point. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, any other questions? No? Yes. How do you synchronize the user capabilities on the front end and the server? I mean, at some point, user could hack and adding some capabilities array and... Yeah, as I said, the server needs to be the authority. So it doesn't matter what the user tries to do. Um, they, they still need to be, first of all, authenticated with the server. So like the server knows what user is communicating them with them. Um, and um, regardless of what the user tries to do, the server should enforce it. It's the only reason you would need to have the client know the capabilities is so that you can reflect correctly on the UI. And so if the person manipulates their capabilities to have more capabilities than they really do, that's not, I'm like, okay, you're going to see things you can't do, but you knew that because you were the one who manipulated the capabilities, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, capabilities don't have an uh, IRB, right? And normal in uh, role-based access control. Um, there are versions of role-based access control where you have hierarchical roles, which is what you're talking yeah, exactly. about. Yeah. Uh, roles or capabilities? Capabilities. Uh, capabilities, I think, are just the children of that system. Then capabilities are just the actual thing you can do, and the hierarchy always comes from the uh, roles. I think ooh, sort of. Um, I, it's an interesting point you're making. Yeah, that perhaps. Hmm. I would need to think about that. Do you have an example? Um, this because so uh, uh, in your example you would augment the capabilities for your specific view, mm -hmm. and then this can create many mm. many things that are. I see so what you mean. Specific. Yeah, you could say like um, if you can uh, view orders, then you can view the menu. That would be like it would follow directly from it. Cool. Yeah, um, I thought about, um, I see what you're saying, and I kind of rambled when I said, you know, if you don't think this should be in the view, then I don't know where it should be, because it really is view specific. And if you got rid of that particular UI component that had the menu in it, you'd have these capabilities somewhere calculated that were not relevant. That's, that's why I thought it was justifiable that they would be specific to, just before you render that template, if it has capabilities that are specific to like that UI component, then that's where you would calculate them. Because otherwise you're now keeping information about how your UI is structured in your capability definition. And we only allow that kind of knowledge of the structure for CSS. 
and then that's another conversation. And then if you have to, to go through all the lists of capabilities for a role, you may have the yeah, so few specific stuff that can be um, duplicated. Yeah, it'd and be really it can be more complicated to <coughs> just go through it. Everything. It'd be really interesting if you could somehow define yeah, I, I think it, there's maybe some super fancy way you could then somehow cache that as like, this is the capability of the user based on the, the structure of my application, but, um, but I was talking specifically about like, in the database, you look at it, there's these roles, these people have it, they have these capabilities, it should have nothing to do with um, the UI elements, it should have to do with your business entities, so like users, orders, like, things like that. So wouldn't it be maybe easier to actually build a like super set of capabilities for a role and then it will be just like one role for user or like many roles? And then probably it will be like less ifs and less conditions in the view because then let's say we have like five roles and then capabilities can be like um, it can be double like for some roles, but then by adding role to a user then it's just like you check the user and then uh, the role, and then the role has the list of what the role can do actually. What was the question part? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's just like I, yeah. uh, I was like thinking because maybe that's like something where the, the other person said that maybe like also the other um, the other solution for the capabilities for checking this would also like work and would also like would solve the problem of of this thing. Uh, that's just like. Yeah, I mean, do you think it would work like better? I maybe? think. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I can imagine a case for these hierarchical capabilities, but whether or not you can see a UI element isn't one of them. I think. What I guess is the point I'm trying to. Yep. Question. Like, yeah. What happens, for example, if you have uh, rule sets that uh, restrict part of other rule sets, and you want to have a person which has these two? These two rules, these, these two roles. So if you don't have that, that here. So imagine the person had two roles. Yeah. And one of the roles didn't include some of the capabilities. Yeah. And one of the roles did include some of the capabilities. And, and one of the roles will say you are not allowed to do some of that stuff. There's no the non. There's no non. There's no disallowing. It's only the capabilities, and this is oh, why I okay. made the distinction between permissions and capabilities. Um, the capability is the ability to do something. There's nowhere in your database the you can't do it. That actually, um, <clears throat> you don't say like, can they not do it? That doesn't, there's no exclusions. Um, so that's why it's additive. It's why it's additive. There's no exclusions. It's okay. only what they can do. I can imagine a scenario where a person is working through a process and in that process, they shouldn't be able to do a certain functionality because it would somehow break um, that process. But they have this other cap they have this other role that grants them those capabilities. Um, <clears throat> then there would be another way to fix that. And there's, I guess, maybe the direct answer to your question is there's no exclusions. There's no explicit exclusions. There's only what's allowed. Yeah. yeah. Um, where do you draw the line between having uh, the communicating the user they can achieve the new information through some action, or having not having so much noise around the interface with all the things that they could do but they they are not allowed right yeah. now? Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's really a case by case basis that I look at as a, as a designer because. Um, because I built this tool, it's obviously not our main product. Um, I have a small team of me and me, and I'm the designer as well as the developer of this product. And so I actually look at it on a case by case basis. Like, is is telling someone they can do this going to be a distraction, or is telling them they're going to be do be that this exists as a capability um, something that would. Uh, tip them off as like, this is possible, I should find out how to do it. So um, there are, um, one, one reason to not have a button for distraction purposes is if that button seems so 
destructive that the person might actually just like 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 psychologically be turned off by it. So like delete everything um, probably um, isn't a feature you would just want to show all the time. And then if they click it, be like, don't worry, you can't delete anything. I think like that's scary. I think as opposed to um, just a joke. As opposed like um, as I get, as, a, as an example. So um, in SoundCloud we have. Um, it, it can happen that someone's account gets hacked because they shared their password with somebody or they have a malicious fan member or something. Um, and someone hacks into the account and like uh, we find out about it and we try and um, we want to lock them out of the account. So in order to lock them out of the account, we do something called revoke password. And revoke password is super simple. What it does is it just generates a really long random hash and sets that to the password. Now no one can get access to the account and uh, we send a password reset to the real owner. So we have this button called Revoke Password. It's kind of important that, it, that everyone knows that that feature exists, so they're like, oh my god, I'm in this situation where we really need to like, revoke access to this account to anybody who has the password. Um, so I show the button, but when you click it, it's like, hey, not everyone's allowed to do this. Uh, talk to the trust, trust and safety team. So it's, it's important for them to know it's possible, but it's not that, like, if you revoke someone's password, it's not like you've deleted their account. So for me, it's very much a balance of, you know, am I communicating some useful information or am I distracting them? It's really case by case. And I actually have three different ways that I handle it. I expect it to have, like, every time the person doesn't have a capability, I'm going to do this. And that's going to be the always the solution. But um, what I end up doing is have, I have three different cases. Um, don't show it, uh, show it, or like the whole page would be not working if you couldn't do it, so just like state it up front. So I have it sort of both ways, three ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you again.